Uh, really excited for today. Uh, I think this can kick off a um, good long-term R&D um, uh, project to in imbue our networks with drastically better security and better privacy. Uh, what I want to talk about today is um, this, this kind of like a higher level talk um, that uh, kind of tries to funnel in um, and, and go through a, a set of kind of important points for everyone working on this um, on this topic. So first off, I want to go through why secure and private communications are critical for human rights. Um, I've come to believe that this is one of the, the most important things to get right in the next um, uh, decade or two. Um, I want, then I want to talk about why secure and private communications are hard, like inherently why um, this is such a difficult problem to get right. Um, third, I want to go through strategies for how to achieve secure and private communications, meaning um, uh, not specifically which uh, cryptographic constructions, but meta strategies of how you organize large groups of people uh, towards this, this, um, uh, these efforts. Then I want to talk about why Web3 is special here, why Web3 can um, succeed where other approaches um, uh, have failed in the past, and also what are um, different challenges that Web3 has relating to this. Uh, then uh, I want to dive deeper into content address networks and um, why security and privacy are hard. Um, the, the nuances of, of, the, of why certain things are harder and certain things are easier in content address networks. Um, and then uh, I kind of want to conclude with a kind of an, an attempt to formalizing a bunch of the properties that we want in, um, in the content routing problem. So kind of like the last point is very specific to content routing. Um, the rest of the, the stuff is kind of much more general. Uh, and, and so yeah, we, with each of these points, I'm kind of going to be uh, zeroing in and kind of uh, zooming in. Uh, so um, uh, as Will said earlier, I think that we need a secure and private comp computing platform now. Um, this is one of these things that is only going to get progressively hard to do later. Um, uh, when, when you look back through history, uh, computing has become this tremendously powerful um, uh, platform that is imbuing humanity with uh, superpowers. Um, now we have, you know, on the order of billions of humans and trillions of computers uh, integrated into uh, a live running system, constantly um, uh, interacting with each other. And um, over time, more and more of our activity just is totally governed by uh, the different applications that we use. So just um, a good exercise on this to like convince yourself of this, if you if you, this sounds um, uh, 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 fanciful, is to just kind of log every single time in one day that you interact with some compu uh, computing application or service, and then try to like trace how many application services that interaction has to touch. Um, and you'll see very quickly that it's like a massive spaghetti tangle of tons of uh, different internet services and, and, um, and protocols and, and, and structures that are generating massive amounts of, um, of information, and uh, they're invoking all kinds of computation. Um, uh, much of it completely uh, W with very weak security uh, properties or security guarantees. Uh, so today, I, I sort of claim that um, you can't quite be a modern human without um, um, access to compute the computing platform. And uh, this is only getting <laughs> more severe every year uh, as more and more superpowers gets, get uh, um, deployed into the network. And so this is why like, the, the um, underlying security properties of the internet matter so much, right? Because if, though, if, the, if the underlying platform is not secure um, and you can either break it or uh, revoke access to people or uh, surveil what's going on, um, uh, that can yield a very different, different kind of structure. Uh, so I think right now uh, we're entering this, this very difficult uh, territory where um, you know, for, for, uh, mass surveillance has been a thing for, for many decades, starting with like the early telecommunications networks uh, through the Cold War. We had um, all kinds of surveillance uh, through... Uh, the phone systems and so on. Um, there were, of course, the um, there's not in leaks that were uh, you know critical and kind of revealing just how um, how deep the the the, the surveillance um, apparatus worldwide um, actually is. And I think even that was just a a glimpse into into a lot of what was going on. Um, but I think this is getting uh, drastically worse uh, over time. So now we have not only have we assembled um, massive uh, repositories of social data that have enough information to make extremely reliable predictions about what people might do in the future. Like think of all the social network data sets. Um, 
Uh, but um, uh, those data sets are sort of like getting uh, semi-democratized to many states. Like many, many more states every year can get access to those kinds of data sets, and many more companies can get access to those data sets. So um, you get, you're getting into like a pan panopticon uh, level of um, uh, a problem. Uh, and then when you couple those, um, so, so the issue is not the social networks and uh, and maybe even the passive surveillance um, with the current states. The problem is that that apparatus can then be used by a different uh, governan governance structure that is um, much more draconian and problematic. So it's never about the current, um, you know, th there's all the debates about uh, privacy surveillance and so on tend to be, tend to center on um, the current governments and the current um, um, uh, police forces and so on that are trying to keep people safe, uh, but it's never about them. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really like, even as well-intentioned as everyone is right now, um, it's really about the future. It's about like what, uh, what future group is going to take power and what future group is going to use the, um, these incredibly powerful structures that are left uh, be behind. And so it's, it's not about um, uh, the current states. Is it, it just imagine some um, extremely nefarious future state that gains power uh, and takes control of that machinery to then implement a, a, an extremely terrible situation. Um, this is now getting connected to uh, incentive structures and automated um, kind of mechanism design. Um, you, you can think of the, the social credit system in China as like one, one example of this, where um, the, behave, the, the, the direct surveillance of people is automatically uh, fed into uh, kind of like a control theory loop, where now it's going directly into um, issuing out fines for certain behavior or changing credit scores, which uh, and the credit scores then uh, confer access to certain um, uh, government systems like access to uh, trains, access to flights, access to um, uh, uh, to money to be able to and loans and so on to be able to to operate. Uh, so you, you have an extremely powerful platform being put in place um, with with a form of control that is, that is completely unprecedented. I don't think you know humanity has never seen a level of con of potential social control as, as what's getting built now, and um, as things progress uh, in the next few decades, all of that is going to get coupled with um, think of think of robotics and and how that's going to enable this kind of, this kind of thing. Um, think about what's going to happen once AR and VR become much more prevalent, or when BCIs start coming in, and like suddenly you, you no longer have to worry about attacks on your computer. You have to worry about attacks on your brain. Like what? Um, and and um, the the uh, the the model like the ML models that we have today, let alone kind of much more intelligent systems, um, are, are strong enough and good enough to uh, to coordinate massive scale action um, in, in response to to circumstances. Just think of things like Alpha Star um, playing StarCraft against um, uh, against opponents in that environment. Uh, so think of um, the the computing infrastructure that is possible now uh, can enable this um, sort of, uh, Orwellian digital totalitarian state that is extremely hard to get out of. Um, so I think today we're like um, still in time to upgrade the uh, infrastructure to avoid and avert this kind of um, potential outcome. Uh, but I think it's really critical to to, to work on this. Uh, I, this is um, not alone in thinking this. Uh, a lot of people think of this as well. Um, recently, have been uh, chatting to a number of people in um, groups like the Future of Life Institute and so on who regard this potential problem of like arriving at an Orwellian state as one of the highest. Uh, risks that humanity has to, has in the moment. Not quite an extinction risk because um, Orwellian states, states tend to not want to uh, become extinct, but um, definitely an extremely bad outcome for, for humanity. Um, so yeah, I think uh, hopefully that convinces you that we need a secure and private computing platform now ahead of when, when um, uh, groups in the future, uh, much more uh, nefarious groups in the future uh, might take control of um, you know, super powerful um, uh, machinery. Uh, great, so uh, what's hard about this? So um, the internet is uh, an extremely difficult medium to try and secure. Uh, it, it, there's, again, trillions of devices, billions of humans, all kinds of information and computing. Um, it's happening, um, uh, you know, it, securing the communication in one link between two parties is already extremely hard. Now think of um, dealing with all of the different links between all of the different um, machines um, and, and think of all of the data that gets generated along the way. Um, and all of the correlations that, that you can uh, start doing. So all the uh, metadata problems are um, extreme when you think about how easy it is to correlate all kinds of traffic uh, in the network if you can observe all the packet flows. Um, uh, you, 
Yeah, let's see. So w when, when you think about the internet grapevine and you think of all of this massive scale um, uh, machinery, just think of every single node here and every single wire as like a potential problem. Uh, and so building secure systems out of uh, something like this is tremendously difficult. Um, and uh, the, the added uh, bonus here is that every cryptographic technique that we have to try and, and, and or not every, but um, most cryptographic techniques that we have to try and um, prevent certain kinds of metadata collection or correlation and so on, just um, achieve that by creating protocols in terms of rounds and in terms of um, hiding uh, legitimate access through a bunch of noise. Um, so that means like many more operations than, than, than you need. So they tend to mean a massive performance hit uh, and with that massive performance hit, uh, then convenience goes away. And as soon as convenience goes away, then people don't want to use those things because they become like just not nearly as, as good as the traditional, um, as other unsecure, insecure, more um, uh, less private, uh, less private structures. Um, so the, the challenge is double. Not only do you have to get the 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 uh, the tech right, not only do you have to get all of the um, the structures to be really good and and uh, and and help that they compose well. But you also have to make it work as well as, or ideally better than, uh, the other counterparts, so that people will adopt these, so that people will actually use them and and move over to them. Um, I think the the um, signal is a good example of great success in this, of actually producing a messenger that was good enough in terms of UX and good enough in terms of privacy that a lot of people started switching. Uh, that said, it's still not the main dominant platform. Like most of the most people still use uh, many other messenger systems out of convenience, out of being able to message each other with stickers, out of like ni nice smooth UX flows. Like um, even now I'm like, ah, Signal is like really good, but like uh, Telegram is just so much nicer and like, Telegram is like totally busted compared to Signal. Um, well, I, I don't know if it's busted, but um, I just, right now we probably would trust Signal more. Um, so um, yeah, I think uh, one thing that I, I think Signal did really well here uh, in the past was work with many other groups to try and upgrade their privacy. Uh, I wish we could see that a lot more. Um, that would make it a lot easier if we had many more um, shots on goal to produce a really high quality service um, that then we're able to share all the knowledge about um, how to make a private uh, a private system. Uh, so the, the, once you start kind of diving into into a lot of the the uh, crypto and so on, uh, there's just an enorm enormous attack surface. Uh, every single system that you might make has tons of different potential attacks. As soon as, as you start coupling those systems with, with others, um, some properties in one might get violated by, by the composition with another. So um, as you start putting together a piece, uh, like puzzle pieces and in, in form a larger, larger structure and larger construction, then you end up with, um, with extremely difficult um, uh, to satisfy constraints and, and you tend to uh, it tends to get extremely hard to, to secure systems. Um, cryptography is a massive field. Like there's apparently 838,000 results in Google Scholar for cryptography. Uh, so there's a ton to write about, a ton to uh, reason about and so on. Um, and super, super active um, uh, field. And a ton of it is extremely practical and oriented around um, real world systems uh, in, in kind of the, the short term uh, time period. Uh, a, a good case to kind of uh, look at is the kind of ORAM model or like the oblivious RAM model um, where you want to try and achieve a, a structure where the adversary controls the, all of the computing machinery that is going to store um, uh, some data and can observe all accesses to that uh, memory. And you even in that extreme setting where the adversary controls everything and can see everything, uh, you want to uh, use a pattern um, of accesses and a pa pattern of um, storing data and so on um, that will be secure and private even in that setting. So, and this is possible. There are there are many um, uh, constructions that show that you can you can achieve this. Um, it, you pay some performance head, you pay some performance penalties for achieving this, uh, but it is doable. Um, I don't know if this if these ORAMs have been, you know, wh how large the largest ORAM deployment is. Um, it would be this would be kind of interesting in, interesting work to to, uh, to do. Um, but um, one of the good news here is that because the computing platform is getting so fast uh, in terms of the processing speed and the, um, uh, and the bandwidth and, and, and so on, the storage and, and whatnot, um, you could have these ORAM type systems spread out across the world close to people and you can replicate a ton of the data. So as you generate data, you can push it and replicate it in different places and then have ORAM style accesses close to the user so that you, so that these kind of additional accesses that you have to do against an ORAM um, become low latency, um, localized, and so on. 
but again, you have to worry about uh, what correlations you might be creating. Um, and, and there's kind of like a hard question around, could you really do an RM for everybody? Or, or uh, if you do an RM for one person, uh, then can you think about like the data and information flow happening or correlate between them and sharing with other people and so on? It's an extremely difficult, difficult type of problem. Um, also, the, the other reason why this, this model is a good one is that um, uh, in, in normal settings, uh, this, this came up because people noticed that even when you encrypt, even when you have some, some data structure that is all encrypted, like crypt trees and so on, um, if people are accessing certain parts of information in different uh, ways, you can use that, those access patterns uh, to extract information about what's, what's stored. Uh, and this gets worse as you share that with, as, as you get more and more sharing of the encrypted um, uh, data structures, then it gets um, uh, worse uh, in, in terms of the adversary being able to correlate a lot of those accesses and derive you know, what, uh, what ciphertext might include, what kind of information certain ciphertext might include or be able to actually extract some of the underlying information. Um, so ORMs are like an interesting model, um, but it'd be great to see them kind of deployed more, uh, more widely. Across the board, when you're building different kinds of systems, um, just doing, doing it right and, and actually achieving proper security and proper privacy is monumentally difficult, um, but it's really critical to do. Um, and one other thing here is, uh, the more these systems get coupled with others um, and the assumptions aren't well understood across the board, um, then the more brittle or more unsafe those systems might be. Uh, so when deploying a, a crypto system that is supposed to be uh, actually secure and actually private, uh, it's really critical to kind of understand the whole thing end to end um, and the com any kind of composition there um, you should be very suspicious about. Many, many of these cryptographic primitives do not compose well. You, they, they have some security properties and when you compose them with another, um, it, it doesn't quite work as well. So for example, you might have an ORM that is supposed to be safe, but then you put that ORM on top of some other um, uh, structure or, or you use an ORM in, in, in certain ways and um, you might be breaking the, the properties of that particular construction. Uh, great, so how are, you know, this is really difficult. Uh, it seems like both really critical but impossible. How are we gonna do it? Um, so the good news here is that uh, there's, again, cryptography is a massive field. There's a ton of people working on this. Many people know that this is uh, super important to do. And today, like the, the um, outputs of the, the world of cryptography do give us tremendous superpowers. We can do things today that were you know, thought impossible before. E even like the, the um, you know, beginning of the public key crypto um, uh, story is like a, a good one where people thought um, being able to, um, people thought that encryption had to be uh, done by sharing private keys ahead of time and that you could not establish um, private and secure communications in, in public. Um, and then you had Merkle puzzles and then um, Duffy Hellman and then RSA and so on. And that was an, a great example of uh, coming up with an amazing construction and then enabled uh, an uh, a amazing uh, superpowers afterwards. Uh, and today we're, we're really operating with kind of all this like what people call like moon math where you're, you're doing amazingly uh, amazing things in terms of being able to prove certain systems and prove the computation of certain operations and, and do things in zero knowledge without ha actually having to share information or do things like fully homomorphic encryption where a computer is gonna have a bunch of data and have a bunch of encrypted functions uh, encrypted data and encrypted functions, and it's going to be able to run the encrypted functions over the encrypted data, produce encrypted results, and the computer has no idea what it's done or and no idea of what the underlying data is, um, and you can use those systems to, to build other applications. Now, of course, you pay for it in, in performance and you pay for it in R&D uh, uh, complexity, um, but, uh, but uh, there, there's just an enormous amount of, of promising research across the board. And what's really cool and uh, more, uh, more recently is that a lot of these systems are now getting deployed much faster than before. So I think in the 1995 through 2005 era, it was like there was an important kind of um, sets of different encryption systems that, that got deployed. But for the most part, it was kind of a slow process. And ever since uh, the crypto um, currency world uh, appeared and blockchains appeared, we've gotten a much faster uh, deployment of, of crypto systems. Now, there's a worry there that we might actually be deploying a bunch of things that are broken and we'll only find that out after. Um, but um, I actually think it's, it's really good that we are testing a lot of these things in the wild, often with implicit uh, bounties in the systems and that if you uh, can break some system, you can uh, steal a lot of cryptocurrency. And so that creates like a, just a, a great forge to build secure systems because there's a lot of people out there that are trying to break them constantly. Um, so it's a great uh, you know, automated bug bounty program. Um, 
this is just like a snapshot of like a recent crypto conference. Like uh, there's a lot of extremely interesting work being done. And a lot of this is, um, again, getting deployed uh, much faster. So um, I think in cryptography, like many other fields, uh, the, the critical piece is kind of get, sifting things that are being produced in, in, um, in research environments and getting them into workable, usable states and um, built into software, built into libraries, built into things that you can use uh, and put into products to then be able to ship out uh, to the world and, and let people um, uh, use them more. I think one of the key things here is that we decouple, um, we, we learn from the Signal story and we, we learn from uh, many other things in the past where like, we ideally want to um, decouple approaches as much as possible so that um, research and then implementations and then uh, deployments into product um, can leverage the best results from, from prior art. Um, it would be bad if some groups like create exclusive structures where some key research is like patented such that nobody else can use it um, to sort of like promote a product that then uh, may not actually succeed in the market because I don't know, it didn't have the right stickers. And so you end up in a situation where like extremely valuable contributions end up not being used because of some other problem down, downstream. Uh, and so ideally uh, you, you can uh, do amazing work in research, you can do amazing work in implementations uh, into libraries and, and so on, and, and in, in testing uh, those systems at scale. And then you can learn from that and, and enhance as many products as you can. And so you, you, you want to create a structure where um, at every stage, every group can leverage the best of the prior, of the prior group. And so that means open patents, or, or either no patents or uh, open patent pools. It means um, uh, open source, it means open implementations, it means a lot of implementations, it means robust testing, and then it means like really good standards for certain implementations of things so that they can get into products. Um, and it means a lot of collaboration with large groups that have large products, right? So we should be in a positive sum oriented environment where we should be trying to get the existing large scale products to be enhanced by the by the new crypto systems as opposed to try and create an entirely new new stack that um, that, that just kind of creates a, a better environment. Um, kind of what I mean is with that is like, if we have a good ch shot to um, get the existing infrastructure to become much more private and much more secure, that's a great <laughs> shot that we should take. So we should be um, greatly encouraging the current Web2 giants to um, invest deeply into things like fully homomorphic encryption and into these kinds of privacy techniques so that they can have their, their ad business model without uh, putting humanity at risk, right? So it'd be great to like get to a structure where we can um, convince these, these massive scale um, uh, data platforms to then at least use user protecting encryption to then um, uh, not, not uh, put all of us at risk. Um, and so I think that there's a, a you know, very good positive sum oriented uh, environment where we can do a ton of this work and a ton of this research, build new products and hopefully get them to be successful. But at the same time also um, push a lot of this R&D um, and, and especially really promising solutions to existing systems because they're already installed, right? So the more we can secure existing things, the, um, the better everything's gonna go. Um, and, and also uh, one other component here is um, things get better by intentionally driving R&D through this pipeline. So setting the goal of like saying, hey, there's this hard problem and articulating what that problem is, getting as many people to know about it, um, and then doing the work against that hard problem, coming up with solutions, even partial solutions that just tackle the problem and trying to advance it, organizing communities of, of practice to actually try to tackle on those problems um, and have good ways of, of measuring the success over time, uh, creating incentive structures for doing this. Uh, so being able to kind of highlight important problems and put prices against those or use RFPs or um, grant systems to support many groups that are doing this work. We can like have a, a large scale integrated um, uh, effort to kind of get as much high quality work done um, at every, at every, yeah, totally agree. Um, as much high quality uh, work done um, across this pipeline as possible, right? So um, think, think of like a larger research program here where um, we're like creating, figuring out like really good open problems, um, talk, uh, do, doing periodic surveys of like what is the current state of the art and like what, what works, what doesn't. Um, thinking about like what products currently uh, exist and what products could use what kind of constructions, trying to connect those things and trying to sift things through this pipeline, um, you know, at, at, a, at a pretty fast clip so that we can get, um, so we can get really good, good outcomes. Um, and the other thing here is like, um, it takes many iterations through this whole pipeline to build really good, robust things in, in time, right? So you 
um, go and like find a set of problems. You like t- it takes many approach, many attempts to actually solve some problem. Once you solve a problem, it takes many attempts to actually implement it to get to a robust, good implementation. Then it takes many attempts of that getting put into a product before that product becomes broadly installed uh, in the world. And even after that, you'll notice that that actually had some problem, and then you have to go back to the beginning and and come up with other solutions um, or other enhancements. Or but you solve the problem, but you created a different problem, and now you have to solve that problem. So it takes a lot of iterations with this pipeline um, to get to a good outcome. However, it's very, very um, possible and doable, and we do this all the time across many, many fields. Um, it's just that in this in this particular one, we have to like do it with a, a certain urgency um, uh, and, and get certain outcomes that right now seem pretty hard. Uh, great, so um, what makes Web3 special? Why, why can Web3 um, help a lot here? Uh, so first off, I think it's a community that is um, extremely focused on verifiability and building um, trustable and dependable systems out of trustless technology. So um, the entire uh, community is oriented towards building systems that um, you can rely on, uh, systems that can uh, cryptographically prove um, correctness, economic structures that yield services, um, and never quite relying on um, words or contracts or uh, laws or courts or anything like that um, to build uh, robust systems. That's a a much stronger foundation for this kind of uh, operation um, because math and Cryptography and game theory and economics are much more dependable foundations than um, uh, words and contracts that could be changed over time. Uh, and so the the the, the field or, or or the industry in a sense is has like good foundations in terms of the the model for for how to arrive at at um, uh, at long term dependable dependable tech. Now that said, most of these systems are very far away from um, the right level of security. So I think. Um, the Web3 world has good security in some areas, and it does have some better systems um, when it comes to some very narrow uh, definitions, like being able to have like public blockchains with public smart contracts and have those be that be a secure computation. Like that's pretty good. We have zero knowledge proofs, which is is um, uh, really good, and we're pushing that research. Um, we have um, you know these systems are robust enough and large enough that you can have things like private um, or public blockchains and and public currencies. And we now have private, um, even private currencies with like um, you know zero knowledge uh, money and so on. Like it's good examples of like some very narrow successes. However, it's also a disaster when it comes to reader writer privacy. Um, everything is kind of in the public. There's all kinds of correlations you can draw. Even the best systems probably are um, you can use metadata to to figure out all of the operations. Um, and so in, in terms of privacy, Web three is like in a terrible state. Um, and arguably much worse than the Web 2 world. So the Web 2 world um, is actually fairly private uh, comparatively. Uh, You have things like um, the fact that there are massive cloud systems that, uh, you know, as long as those are are operating honestly and operating well, uh, then you can sort of like trust their operation. You have VPNs, you have um, pretty good loss in certain jurisdictions that sort of like require certain deletion of, of, of data and so on. So it's like Web 3 is nowhere near being better than that. Now we have to get better than that, and we can get better than that. Um, the community in general is very interested in, in, in achieving that and has many projects towards it. Um, plus it has like the, the right uh, foundations where you want to get that all the way in a publicly verifiable way and make the arguments in terms of math, not in terms of um, um, a, a privacy policy that could change at any moment or that could be changed not because the company intended it, but because it was compelled to do so by, by a secret court somewhere. So um, uh, one other component here is that Web3 has very strong values around establishing digital rights. So things like freedom of speech, um, freedom of communication, freedom of assembly, um, users being able to own and control their data, um, decentralization in general, not really uh, trusting central authorities. All of these are like really good values that you, that you want when your goal is to kind of produce this, this kind of safe crypto system. Um, now we have to like actually make it happen. Like we're, we're very far away from establishing uh, all of these things. Um, but but uh, but we can do it, and all of these values map to specific systems. Like each of these, you can break down into specific um, digital crypto systems that you can um, think about uh, producing and, and, and constructing, and so on. Um, the hard part here is that you really have to model them end to end, and not accidentally build something that's really safe, but you know the metadata around the around the edges um, enables um, uh, uh, breaking it. A, a very good example of this is the the, the famous like. Um, 
uh, you know, in the top left, uh, here, let me make it big. This is such a good like lesson in crypto system building. Um, um, there was, this is from a, um, a, a uh, post-it note, I think, where um, uh, <laughs> some agents were like <laughs> figuring out how to break uh, Google's encryption, even though they had like a pretty good setup or whatever, like they just found a weak point, uh, you break that and then you can, you can bust the whole system. Um, so like that, you know, as we build um, a bunch of secure large scale crypto systems in Web3, we should be very, very careful that like it work, fully works end to end and subject the entirety of the system to like the, the, the most stringent scrutiny possible <laughs> across the community. Um, you know, everything from like the, the very, um, yeah, it, everything from like how the, the research model, like the actual like model of the system, what like the implementation, how the implementations work, how the deployments work, how does the software um, distribution channels work, like the entire kind of pipeline of like building the software and pushing it out there and so on. All of that we have to get into, into a really good, good state. Um, w one good thing here that another thing that uh, Web3 has is like hash linking and hash linking is tremendously powerful for all of this. You can like make um, strong assertions about, uh, about software, strong assertions about uh, data and so on. And it becomes like an amazing superpower to enable a lot of these things. So uh, we have some like really good superpowers. Um, another thing we have is the benefit of cryptoeconomics. So we can use uh, cryptoeconomics itself to construct these kinds of systems and provide for their operation. So the fact that you can have a, um, these cryptocurrency networks that provide a service and a broad utility to the world, and they're kind of self-standing through economic incentives, um, provides a really good, good, good uh, substrate for um, building these kinds of systems because you no longer have to rely on a particular uh, corporation in a particular country continuing to have a business model or potentially going disappearing because that business model is um, sort of like wanes or because that business model um, um, suddenly is no longer kind of um, accepted in that environment. Uh, so we've been very lucky so far that there are many corporations that kind of like have fought hard to preserve uh, certain rights and freedoms and so on. Um, but ideally, we could end up in a spot where that just sort of happens uh, through very strong incentive, uh, incentive structures, independent of specific people, independent of specific organizations, and so on. Uh, one other thing that crypto economists can do, not just in terms of like helping you design um, pretty successful um, protocols and being able to run um, open services and utilities, it can all, you can also use crypto economics to incentivize the entire R&D pipeline across this, right? So you can use the crypto economics primitives themselves to cause a ton of R&D to happen across these things. You can do things like put up bounties for breaking certain things. You can put up uh, put bounties and, and grant programs and RFPs for building kinds of things. Um, and I think we'll see over time um, a, a large amount of, of R&D funding coming from crypto networks to fund even basic research uh, in the early you know, um, at work. So think of all of the zero knowledge um, uh, explosion that we've seen in the last two or three years as all funded by um, by the by, by crypto economics, um, uh, in, in, it's sort of like a lot of it is routed through private capital markets and so on. But today, um, but I think that even if that hadn't happened, that research would have been routed through public um, token markets. So think of crypto economics as as um, a really powerful uh, set of tools that you can use to build these systems, um, not just in, in the actual implementations, but in the meta structure of being able to fund, uh, develop, and fund groups to go and, and, and pursue these kinds of projects. Um, so it's a super powerful tool. Think of warping the incentive structure, uh, warp, warp, being able to warp the incentive structures to cause uh, certain outcomes. Uh, so yeah, you can use mechanism design in a, in a pretty powerful way. Um, so I think you, you, Web3 is like really well poised to improve the structure. So today, you know, I tend to think of like, the internet is pretty, um, is pretty good. The, we have like a pretty scalable and, and pretty secure computing infrastructure on top of that. Uh, you know, fairly secure. Uh, maybe we could rate it yellow instead of instead of green, but um, it's like fairly good. We have personal computing devices broadly distributed around the world. Those like tend to work really well. Um, we have a ton of uh, applications and so on. Um, but our human superpowers are um, condition. All of this entire structure is conditioned on a set of contracts and end user license agreements and uh, terms of services and corporations and courts. Um, and so all of that ends up creating a really uh, unstable and shaky foundation for this edifice of technology that we've built on top. Because at the end of the day, someone somewhere can, um, you know, some government somewhere can change their mind about something, um, especially critical in like, you know, any kind of important crisis 
So think of like times of, of, of um, fast crises as moments where um, all of the old freedoms go out the window, right? So wars are, have typically in history been a great moment for, you know, forget about all those important rights that we all thought were important. Uh, they're all gone now. Um, and only if like um, uh, good, uh, the, like groups succeed and then restore all those rights and freedoms, do you get them back? Um, there, there have been many times in history where that didn't quite happen and you, those old rights never came back. Um, and we've been very lucky to, um, to be in a timeline where like things actually worked out fairly okay. So it would be great to, to kind of establish a, a much stronger foundation underneath all of this to get to you know, hard math, hard cryptography, and economics um, to drive the creation of these superpowers and the, the long-term maintenance. So that you don't have to rely on um, kind of these much more, um, I think, unreliable components. I think these, these underlying systems are um, less reliable than, than, than math and economics. So, so I, uh, I think like Web3 has that promise. Now we have to cause it to happen. Uh, there's a ton of work to do this, um, but it is a, a, a pretty stable foundation that worth building on. Uh, and yeah, I, th I think um, uh, in general, the whole field, the whole industry is, is very interested in funding public goods, very uh, keenly aware of the R&D pipeline. Um, there's a, a, a very high proportion of people working in, in the earlier parts of the pipeline and so on. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of kind of regenerative finance, public goods funding, decentralized science, and, and so on. Uh, great, so now let's get uh, much more specific in, into content address networks. So going back to the, to the internet uh, grapevine, uh, so today, because of location addressing, um, mo a lot of the communications are forced to go to specific locations. And so that's, um, that can be, you can leverage that over time to kind of do, do all kinds of surveillance in different spots. Um, this can get a lot harder for the adversary if um, <clears throat> you start, start propagating um, content and information all the way to the edges. <clears throat> if you have a structure where you're pushing massive amounts of content all the way down to the edges, and then... Um, uh, users and so on are just reading local information or, or going to each other or going um, just to their ISP and, and coming back, then it gets a lot harder practically um, to surveil all the different different points in, the, in, in, in this network. Um, you also have a model where it's not like write once and then like read many times from, from all over the world, but you have a model where like as you write, you sort of propagate updates to the rest of the world, but you can do a bunch of write uh, reads locally. Um, and so you, you just have a different access pattern by default in these content address systems um, that end up doing better across many kinds of um, uh, uh, attacks or, or correlation attacks um, that, that, that adversaries might, might, uh, might deploy. Um, the flip side, though, is that uh, you are in an environment where you can't just rely on like, secure links between a few parties because you end up in these kind of protocols where like, there's a lot of like, spamming of, of information uh, to achieve it. Right? So you, you tend to like, spam out um, requests for certain content and you tend to spam out lookup requests to like connect to certain peers. So today in most of these systems, all of, all of those operations are super, like you can observe a ton of it and you can um, draw all these correlations between, between, uh, between systems. Now, the good news there is that there are some really good um, crypto uh, cryptography solutions to those kinds of problems. You can get into you know, things like mix nets and things like um, um, uh, routing systems, uh, like oblivious routing systems, and, and um, uh, systems where um, you, can tr you, you have a network of participants that are meant to propagate messages and diffuse messages over a network and make that, that diffusion um, hard to correlate and hard to, um, um, hard to leak information about. So um, it's, starting in a, it's going in a different track of, of, of um, how to build um, information distribution systems um, that, con that confers a bunch of advantages for um, for, for solving these problems. Now, the downside is that because it's a much newer um, uh, trajectory and much newer uh, set of systems, then we have a lot less research on it. So we have just drastically less R&D on content-addressed, secure, private networks than we do for location-oriented networks. So we basically have to catch up and do a ton of R&D work to, um, to, to end up with like, um, uh, pretty good systems. The good news, uh, another good news here is that um, the storage densities on our side it's getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper to just ship a lot more uh, data to people and to store it in a bunch more parts of the internet. Um, so a lot of systems that, uh, and, and also computing hardware is getting faster. So those, those two things mean that a lot of cryptographic protocols that maybe seem completely infeasible five years ago or 10 years ago are now um, viable and um, can work at pretty good 
performance as measured by a human trying to use the thing. Um, so yeah, I think it, uh, also worth noting like the whole NDN and CCN uh, literature is full of uh, tons of really good protocols for, um, for content addressing and, and content routing and so on. Um, but most of them, those haven't been you know, uh, designed with privacy in mind or with, with the um, adversarial security in mind. Um, so when, whenever, so, so read them for a lot of ideas, but in many cases we have to like start from scratch because uh, there's like some fundamental um, incompatibility there. Um, or in many cases, you can take NDN networks or CCN style networks and just drop them on top of mixnets, and they'll work. Um, they might not be um, they might not be fast uh, if you try to like do CCN on top of a mixnet, but like maybe it's a way to like start, and then from there you start improving it. Um, uh, great. So I wanted to kind of end by giving you a a view into I'm like trying to formalize the the content routing problem. So I'll kind of like just take you through this and speak about a few different properties. Um, and, and so this is like, it's gonna be a little bit redundant, but, but just let's kind of walk through it um, and kind of establish a shared language for today. Um, so in, in kind of, um, uh, so, so the content routing problem is the, the specific underlying problem within a content address network um, where you have um, you know, a certain set of content providers that have content and want to uh, serve it out to various users. You have a set of consumers that are trying to retrieve that content and, and, and use it in some way. And you're trying to um, connect the content consumers and the content providers to exchange that information. Um, now, ideally, in the full content addressed data distribution system, you would want the whole thing to be, to, you want to be able to provide certain guarantees about the whole model so that when clients are retrieving data from providers, you can like hide the accesses and so on. Um, that's, that's a much harder problem um, and much harder to get like a one single uniform system across the board. So that's not quite what we're working on in content routing security. We're working on a reduced problem, which is, um, hey, just assuming that the, the uh, connectivity between a content consumer and a content provider can be secured in some other way through mixnets or other things, um, just the problem of storing routing information and making it available to both providers and clients so that they can find each other, just that part, just the problem of how do clients know which con provider to go to, how, how consumers go know which provider to go to, that problem, um, we can, if we can build a pretty secure version of that um, and broadly distribute it, then it makes, makes it a lot easier to build those other larger systems that can have you know, proper end-to-end -end, um, security guarantees about privacy through the whole thing. Um, so um, in order to kind of enable those consumers and providers to, to find each other, we can use a set of content routers. Uh, now these content routers might be um, uh, separate devices, or they might be the same devices. So it, you could have a, a, a network where the routers are both, you know, the, the, it could just be the content providers acting as routers, it could be the providers and the consumers acting as routers, or you could have dedicated separate devices that are routers that are neither providers or consumers. Um, now you can use um, cryptographic artifacts like provider records uh, that store some information about the um, set of content providers and the content that they're providing um, to store some information in the network, in the routers, to make it um, possible for consumers to, to find, find, um, find that, co uh, that content. And this is kind of what we describe as you know, provider records. And you can think of like a record being produced by a certain provider and having you know, a certain data that, that, is, that is, it's about. And for, for most of our purposes, we think of those records as using CIDs, like content identifiers, as the, as the way to um, think about content. But these could evolve, of course, like these could become selectors or other kinds of uh, information structures. And, and you have a model where when consumers query routers for uh, the content, they get zero or more corresponding provider records. Um, and it doesn't have to be complete, because at the end of the day, consumers just care about getting the data. They don't care about finding all possible providers for a thing. Uh, you know, these are like some you know, basic definitions about you know, what content providers are. You know, think of a, a dynamic set of content providers. You, you have many more providers you know, coming and going over time. Um, they per, their, their actual data sets change over time. Um, and you want to be able to kind of reason about the, uh, the records that they're making over time and how they're advertising those to, to various, ri uh, writers, uh, various routers. Um, then you have a um, you know, set of content routers that are you know, storing that information um, and facilitating the search by uh, providing access to those, to those records. Um, they might um, engage in some complex cryptographic protocol to um, store those in particular ways, or whenever a search is 
um, whenever a client is, is issuing a query to find certain records, they, routers might have to do a ton of operations themselves within their own data structures, or they might have to do a bunch of operations with other routers um, in order to, to um, extract the records and be able to, to serve a query. But you ideally want to get into a spot where the routers have no idea what they're doing. You, you want the routers to not know what the data is, and you want the routers to not know who the providers of the clients are or, or what they're interested in. Uh, and, but you want to build a, a system where, where these routers can provide a pretty efficient and secure, uh, uh, a pretty efficient um, uh, system to the clients and, and, and providers. Um, so these, these uh, you know, consumers are making requests to routers, usually providing um, the, the, the content address that they're looking for, or providing some encrypted version of that. So you can think of taking content addresses and creating some encryption of them and using that as the query um, as a query parameter, so that routers don't can't recover what the actual actual data is. Um, and then, when you're thinking about the data, you can think of the data as having links to other data. So that could be, you know, think of uh, um, hard uh, cryptographic links like um, uh, CIDs and so on, like immutable links. Or you could have mutable links, like you know, think of just regular um, web links and and so on. Uh, now, you know, kind of a set of useful data structures that we're using to make this problem easier. So we're using CIDs, which are, you know, self-certifying, verifiable identifiers for a specific piece of data. Um, now, CIDs are, like, pretty useful because, you know, they, they kind of are modular in terms of the, um, they're parameterized in terms of the hash function and the encoding functions and so on. You know, for simplicity, we just think of a CID. But, you know, it's worth noting that there's, like, a many-to-one mapping here. You can have many CIDs that all map to the exact same set of bytes. And that's because you could be hashing with multiple different hash functions, or, or you could be using different encoding functions, and so on. Um, and, and then, of course, like once you have a specific byte stream, you could have different byte arrangements that represent the same uh, information for users. Right? You can, of course, have like different ciphertexts that encrypt the same information. You could have different layouts of arranging the same information. And so you can take a single file and chunk it in different ways and then arrive at different uh, graphs and so on. So you, you can't quite rely on like knowing that like, there won't be like one CID for every unique um, piece of information. Now, um, there's a lot of the magic is in the provider records. So you can think of um, maintaining this like dynamic set of provider records. Uh, think of those as advertisements that the provider has a set of, uh, set of content. Um, you uh, each provider record uh, is uh, has a particular provider that it's associated with and a particular set of data that it's associated with. That could be just a single item or it could be many items. Um, and there's a set of properties that, and this is where we start getting into the, the nice formal properties. There's a set of properties that you might want about, about the records. You might want records that are non-repeatable. So this means that if the record is produced, then it, it should have only been produced using the direct authorization of that provider, meaning that you might carry a digital signature. So the record itself identifies that the provider said, I have this. Uh, you can also make, make it stronger and include a, um, a content verification as part of that, where you can in include a proof of storage of some kind um, and potentially a proof of storage at a particular moment in time um, to, in order to produce a record. So you could actually produce these kinds of records that not, not only carry a signature that the provider had the content, but an actual cryptographic proof that they had that content at that particular moment in time. Now, that, that can be really useful for clients, and it can help avoid a bunch of spam from adversaries, but it creates a problem. Now you have um, you know, a direct link between the providers and what content they had. So if the providers um, are not storing encrypted content that they don't know anything about, and they can tell what they're, t they're, they're storing, that might be a problem because you might have places where um, you know, th that might be like a, an action that they shouldn't be taking. So you might also want certain records to be uh, reputable, uh, where you can produce those records without direct authorization. And so you'll, you tolerate some spam um, in order to uh, b give plausible deniability to providers of storing that information. And so see, this sort of depends on, on, on a system. A system might want uh, these non-reputable records, or a system might want reputable records. Uh, you might also you know, um, have uh, temporary records that only have validity for a certain period of time or a certain, um, under a certain set of conditions. Um, and you might use things like spam costs, where um, you might allow um, not, uh, reputable records but introduce some cost to generation, uh, where like maybe a provider, a legitimate, honest provider that has the content can produce that record cheaply, but a provider that does not have the data can produce a record as well with some significant cost. And so that creates a, a kind of like 
um, and you can think of like you know turning through so many keys and like breaking a key uh, in order to provide that record. This provides a pretty in between sweet spot between like allowing some spam to create a you know plausible deniability, but can cut down on the spam problem. Um, you might be able to you might want to be able to aggregate records and and create a, a, a data structure that can like over time aggregate different pieces of data or many providers for the same data. Uh, now you might want to have encrypted records where the routers can't see them, and only certain parties can can decrypt them. Uh, or you might want, you know, fully homomorphically encrypted records where you can operate on, um, uh, you can operate on the records um, uh, while they're encrypted, which which is kind of like where routers want to be. Routers want to be operating on those records without knowing what what they're doing. Now, when you think about like piecing together these these three sets of agents, like the the consumers, the routers, and the providers using the content addresses and the records, you can piece those together into a content routing system um, th that you know, describes a protocol that um, allows these agents to use these data structures to implement um, uh, one of these content routing systems. And there's a set of properties that you might want about these systems. You might want the system to be authenticated, like you know all the identities, you, all of them have cryptographic identities, all of them can, can sign messages with public key crypto or something like that. Uh, you might want this to be self-certifying, where agents have their own public keys and you can only dial them at their public keys, and they can sign messages um, um, using their public keys and so on. Um, and you, you might want the data itself to be you know, hash linked and so on, so there's like some self-certification uh, properties going on. Um, now, now, when it comes to privacy, here's like where, where it gets, gets, starts getting interesting. You know, first off, like the basics, you can have you know, transport encryption between parties, so the message is passing itself is encrypted. Uh, you might have like um, I don't have it quite here, but you, you might want kind of um, transport uh, mixing here, uh, where where you want to you want to prevent adversaries from knowing what parties are sending what messages to what other other parties, and so that's a really key property in making these things um, uh, making these things work. Uh, you might want writer privacy, where um, providers can provide content to a subset of consumers. Um, uh, but without the unauthorized consumers or routers or adversaries learning what the provider has published. So writer privacy is this extremely good property where a, pub a content producer can publish content out to the world, um, but only the authorized parties that, that can retrieve the information know that they did that. Everybody else just sees a bunch of ciphertext and cannot uh, know who's storing what. And you might have different forms of this writer privacy. You might have um, identity right of privacy, where adversaries cannot learn who provided the content. They could see that the content was provided, but they can't, can't tell who. Uh, you might have content right of privacy, where the adversaries cannot learn what exactly the content is. They might be able to see that certain providers are spamming, are adding a lot of content, but they don't know what it is. Um, you could have like full kind of like this action pri uh, right of privacy, where adversaries just cannot learn um, that a particular provider has taken any action at all. Like that would be a, like a really great uh, uh, protocol to have. However, this is like difficult to achieve because in order to do this, you have to introduce an enormous amount of noise on top of all the legitimate, legitimate activity, like an order of magnitude or so more, uh, more noise. Um, and then you could get to like full right of privacy, where like no entity learns what entities provide content or what content is being provided at all. Like this is tremendously monumentally difficult to achieve, um, uh, and it kind of requires a bunch of um, different protocols between providers and consumers. Also, because like you don't want to create a system where Maybe the content routing stuff is private and secure, but then later you can just correlate the, the, the consumers getting data from the providers. Now, um, the, the, just like writer privacy, there's reader privacy on the other side. Consumers want to be able to find content without unauthorized providers or routers or adversaries learning that they're looking for that stuff. So maybe the providers have privacy or maybe they don't have privacy, but the consumers might, might want privacy separately. So you can think of systems that like provide both or one, one of them. Um, and, and again, you can have like the identity, content, and action in full notions of reader privacy. Um, now, kind of, um, you might have certain properties about the sets themselves. Like you might have permissionless sets where anybody can become a consumer, anybody can become a provider, any kind of, anybody can become a, a router. Or, um, and you might want notions of consistency over the set. Like you might want an eventually consistent model where anybody can join those sets and nobody can quite know at any moment in time who's in that set. Or you might want consistency in some of these. Like you might want consistency over the routers. You might want consistency over, over the providers. That consistency can be very useful in, in building certain protocols. Like if you know all the routers and, you, and that is a consistent set, 
then that's much easier to store the records because you know precisely which router to go to to store and look up a record. Um, but you know, if it's an eventually consistent model and, it, and it's, you have these sloppy sets, then, then it's much harder to do that. Um, now this is kind of a, uh, sloppy is, a, is this kind of, uh, it's not consistent. You, you maintain a you know, partial information about a set um, and at no point do you, do you have like a, a complete registry um, and nobody quite knows uh, the, full, the full story, but that's enough. And you can use these sloppy sets to be able to um, solve this problem, right? So if a router maintains a sloppy set of providers, they don't have to maintain all of them. They just need to maintain enough so that consumers can get the data. Um, that could be a, a good, good place to be. Or, or you know, maybe routers keep information about a subset of the providers and the clients just find some of them. Um, and so you know, the sloppy sets can be, can be useful. Uh, now there's a traditional kind of liveness properties for any distributed system where you want uh, the system to maintain liveness um, and eventually make progress uh, in the presence of you know, some set of malicious parties. You want the system, so critical here in content routing, you want this to be partition tolerant. You, you cannot uh, tolerate a content routing system that is not partition tolerant because surprise, surprise, the internet breaks down all the time and you have um, partitions happening. Um, and that should not mean that the whole system halts. Uh, there's an, an additional security property there that if, if it's possible to halt operation by creating partitions, like you, your, your system is like, not only is it not gonna work well in, in normal times, like it has a huge attack vector where all an adversary has to do is just create a partition to prevent it from working. And then you might have you know, uh, game theoretic um, uh, security properties like you want the system to be Byzantine file tolerant where you, have, you want it to tolerate a certain number of adversaries um, kind of maliciously uh, running the protocol. Uh, it might not be about the number of adversaries, it might be about the, the amount of power or influence they have over the system. Um, you might want it to be um, uh, BART, which is a Byzantine altruistic and rational tolerant. This means it's an extension on the BFT model that, um, that actually talks about rationality. And, and this is really where the Web3 world is. The Web3 world is not in BFT, it's in BART. Most of the providers in Web3 are rational entities that are maximizing their utility functions and maximize as measured by the amount of cryptocurrency they get. Um, and so you, you really want to design protocols that are rational safe in the presence of maybe a few altruistic, you know, a small proportion of altruistic honest parties um, and, and maybe some powerful Byzantine adversaries. But for the most part, the you want the routers to be able to be rational. You don't want to expect honesty or altruism out of the, out of the routers. Um, and then you need, of course, like, uh, ideally, some of these systems are fully incentive compatible where the rational protocol is exactly the same as the altruistic protocol. That's much harder to achieve. You can usually build systems where you know, the, you, you can, the, the, the system can work given all the rational deviations from the protocol. Uh, cool, and then you know, maybe some like diagrams like you have a bunch of consumers talking to a router network and then some providers, or maybe the clients and providers are all routers too, or you know, maybe there's uh, no routers, they just all know kind of to go to. You know, the best content routing system is one where you don't have to do any content routing at all. Uh, all right, uh, sorry for going, uh, uh, going a bit over, but uh, thank you very much. Uh. Where would this like formalism, where is that heading? What, like what's your motivation in, in you know, taking time for that and like where could that be? Um, well, so in order to write protocols that are actually safe, you need to be able to prove properties about the system. And in order to prove properties about the system, you have to formalize the definitions of what you're proving properties about. So this is like a first step at describing the practical distributed system problems that, we've, that we have in terms that then cryptographers can actually grapple with and say, oh yeah, like the way to achieve this is this. Um, and so this is kind of a step into like framing the problem in such a way that like Cryptographers can work with us to to solve them, um, and this could be like this could be a uh, we could publish some version of this. And this is not um, yeah I want to be like very clear. This is like I wrote this out um, from like my understanding of, of of the model and system and so on, and based on 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 past mm -hmm. learnings. This is not uh, exhaustive, and I'm sure that there's a bunch of reader uh, there's a bunch of important content routing properties that other people have found that are not in here. Uh, and so this is like the larger project here is like maybe create a canonical definition of this thing uh, and maybe publish that as a, as a, as a unit. Um, it's, it's important that these things end up published in academic literature so that, that because um, academics tend to primarily only focus on things coming through the stream of academic publications. You know, not, not, uh, from, not completely, but, but that's just kind of, you increase the likelihood that a lot of 
um, brilliant cryptographers are going to work in the problem if you if you kind of like advertise in the forums they look at and the forums they look at are like you know ePrint and and um, and and the you know Eurocrypt and and Oakland and so on. So if we get these things published, uh, if we get some like if we solve a version of this problem fairly well and include it in that paper, we have a hu huge articulation of the problem and point out open problems. Then you can then just sit back and wait a few years, and then you'll get really good solutions out of it. Do you think it's coming up with a solution, or do you think it's like a systematic meditation of knowledge trying to save what properties are getting from existing systems with this definition scaffolding as? Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's possible to. I mean, it would be great to just publish it as uh, as an independent thing. Um, however, I don't know whether conferences would accept that. They might be like, eh, it's not. There's nothing interesting here, um, and so you might like like. You might smuggle this in along with, uh, you know, some solution, uh, so that they kind of like, but but like really the values here. I don't know. Uh, we could start with a website. Like, just start with a website and defining it there and pointing people towards it. Um, maybe a forum. So Ethereum Research has been very good at producing really high quality cryptography work. Uh, so maybe one poss possibility here is we could actually start a dedicated forum for this problem and then invite a, a set of um, researchers to come. You know, it, it, we have to keep it a very high signal to noise. Um, ratio oriented, um, but uh, but but I think this could be like pretty pretty successful. Yep. Uh, I don't want to put this further. Timeline. What's your like? Obviously, I'm not asking you to do a trend, but more like a, what is your ambitious path for this? Like, what's this is obviously the end goal in some ways. What what's the stepping stones that in the meantime we can start? Working on to move forward because I feel like we've had this, this discussion a few times. Yeah. Obviously, way more fleshed out than I think the last time. I had. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so I think we now have the capability of um, deploying some like partial solutions today, and so we should be engaging in some short-term oriented projects to enhance the properties of the tooling. Now, think of like adopting things like WinFS um, into to provide better. Um, it's kind of like a better UNIXFS, um, and um, also Pyrgos has a ton of like really important properties in uh, in, in preserving a bunch of the, the privacy guarantees that you want. So so maybe there's some like enhancing of both of these systems and then adopting them into into just um, IPFS in general, uh, or, or giving people tools for how to use those to build many kinds of applications. Um, then there's um, also kind of like improving the content writing. Um, storage of like records in the indexers and the DHC. There's like some easy, straightforward things to be done there that could just improve the, the protocols. But but that's not gonna solve it. Like just to be really clear, like all of that stuff is like not good enough to to get to the full um, level of privacy that we need. Uh, to get there, um, I think what we need is like this longer term, like medium to long term pro like larger program where we have like these very strong goals in um, in the long term with important intermediate goals. And you describe a bunch of open problems. You get people to work on those. You produce results. In some cases, you some of the, these results are good enough to now go into live systems. You start doing that while continuing to research more open problems, and over time get to the solution. So you want to kind of progressively upgrade. So think of it as like incremental delivery, but in research timelines. So instead of like you know agile, it's like research agile, which is like you know the the cycle is like years potentially. Um, so I, I do think like we can achieve this and. You know, on the, like I think you could have a super dedicated Manhattan Project style research program to do this in like two to four years, but like that requires changing how the world works. Um, in the current trajectory, I think you could do it in ten years. Um, maybe five. you could probably do it in five. It would be great to do it in five, but it's less aggressive. I think we can get to a pretty good place in five um, that is like just mu dramatically safer than than other networks now, um, but still not fully like. To, to really get a, an, an internet uh, layer that is like um, safe from this stuff, like this is like you know what nightmares are made of. So uh, in order to like really protect from like all of this stuff is um, you know it's like way 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 hard. Um, but I think we can be in a pretty good place in, in like you know three to five years. Um, so yes, yeah, like def definitely like a long term oriented program. Cool. Thank you.